I have been having the luxury of, of two or three months uh, actually not in a role. And I don't know about you guys, but when you're in a role, you get so obsessed with your, actually your own company, it's hard to see what's around. So I have been taking the opportunity to uh, chair a few conferences, talk to a lot of people. I think about about 100 different meetings with various providers and uh, thinkers about Omnichannel and where it's going. So I'm going to try and distill a bit of that for you here. Um, this isn't a Boots view or a John Lewis or a Waitrose view. It's my view. So, you know, feel free to disagree, but I just thought I'd show you some of my perspectives. And to recap, what I'm supposed to be talking about to you today is, in this session, Robin will shed light on a few of the more topical issues in omnichannel retailing today. What do you think is holding retailers back in delivering a true omnichannel experience? What can bricks and mortar players do to take on the pure players, especially as they, uh, the latter enter the high street? Are internal salaries a key barrier in aligning organizations around delivering an omnichannel experience? And how is personalization changing expectations around loyalty? Well, that sounds like the foundation for a book, uh, but I'll see what I can get through um, in the next 20 minutes and, and try and leave a bit of time for Q&A. So let's see if my slides are. Appearing, can we get to the next slide? There we go. So I've tried to distill everybody's sort of thoughts down uh, into one sentence, um, which, which could possibly sum up the omnichannel customer experience. So the customer experience should be joined up at every part of the customer journey to provide a personalized, consistent, and differentiated experience that's easy and convenient to use. Quite easy to say, but a lot of retailers are finding it incredibly hard to do. So why is that? Well, I thought I'd start off with providing you a bit of context. And just before we see this slide, I have borrowed shamelessly from um, something that I saw Accenture and Salesforce do recently, but I have embellished it and added to it. So here's some global context. There we go. So what, th what this grand slide attempts to do is look at 80 years of retailing from 1960 through to 2040, make a bit of prediction about what's happening next. And I think in some ways it helps to frame why Omnichannel is much more complex. So in the 20th century, I'd suggest that retailing was relatively easy. Global brands created products that could be mass marketed and sold through increasingly national and then global retailers. There was clear ownership of the customer by that retailer and mass communication to them as possible uh, by the brand and product owners. But that has all changed. The digital entrance, especially Amazon, have disrupted that old order, formed a new relationship with the customer based on shared data which enables personalization, redefined expectations of value and convenience, and where the majority of marketing is now digital and therefore automated and increasingly pragmatic. So what's the future look like from here? I've made a few little suggestions there on the right-hand side which you might like to digest at your, at your leisure, but um, I think there'll be further disruption, further disintermediation of traditional retailers, um, and this is a key point that we'll come back to later in the morning. Um, who, I think they'll really struggle to find the necessary resources to invest in omnichannel capabilities. A lot of retailers trying to take cost out, perhaps at the detriment of customer experience, but are they really d uh, driving a sustainable business model? So I therefore think it's inevitable uh, that retailers will have to form strategic partnerships and relationships with other retailers and, and other partners uh, to outsource parts of their P&L and what they do in order to get the necessary operational efficiency and customer reach and experience to survive. And I think you can start to see that happen. So in the UK, I think the merger of Sainsbury's and Argos um, is um, a pointer to that, uh, broadening a product range, providing more points of presence, therefore customer convenience, and to also share the cost of investing in technology and supply chains. It's really tough to do. Uh, so it isn't easy, um, and I think retailers will need to decide what they carry on doing themselves and uh, what they get others to do for them. There's a panel, um, so this is a bit of an advert, isn't it? I'm on a panel at 11 o'clock uh, later on talking to some disruptors, some innovators who have got some thoughts about what the future of fulfillment and supply chain is going to be. And, and so I think I, I agree with them. I think this is a, a, a thing that uh, retail is going to have to get, uh, get a grip on. So how do you do omnichannel? Um, well, this is my, this is my blueprint. Um, it, um, it probably needs to be brand specific, probably won't work for everybody, but I think unless you have some sort of overall strategy, some overall omnichannel plan, you're probably not going to be um, able to uh, execute, which I'll come on to in the next slide. Um, what this looks to do is say, at the top half of the slide there, you've got your brand and customer experience. If you're not basing your brand and customer experience 
on what your customers are telling you about what's special about your brand, um, you're, you're probably not going to be relevant or uh, contextual to them. So you really need to be clear about what makes you different. If you're selling products which Amazon is selling, why is it different to get them from you? What's your unique point of differentiation? And what are the new things that you need to develop? What are the new propositions you need to bring into the market to get ahead, to, make, to uh, drive that clear blue water between yourself and your competitors? So unless you're able to innovate and prototype and get things into customers' hands quickly, to test them really quickly, to prove that business case before you make the investment, yeah, you're, you're probably um, going to be in a bit of trouble. So as an organization, you need to find the space to innovate. You need to find the space to do this quickly, get things out to customers, even if they're half built or rate to 20 built, get the feedback and know that they're going to work before you deploy the capital. So that whole proposition piece then needs to, if you look half, about halfway down the slide, you need to think about how that shows up across all of your different interfaces. But behind that, what is your route to market? Uh, when are you going to have your own outlets? What, what purpose do they serve? Where would you work with third-party retailers? If you're a fashion store, would you work with department stores and why? And, and in a, under what circumstances would you w uh, work with a marketplace like Amazon or Alibaba? And what's your profit chain? What's your share of the profit? How much profit do you need to make out of those channels? And how do you make sure that it feels like your brand in each of those channels when that customer comes to shop with you? Towards the bottom of the slide there, I think that does mean that you have to have an increasingly single view of what your customer is doing and also be able to expose to them a single view of the inventory that you're trying to sell to them. There are various stages of that. Um, to go from 0 to 100 on it is very expensive, but there are a lot of providers out there in the hall who will purport to be able to do some of this stuff for you, and some of them can, but, and, it's, and it's better to start with, with something and start putting that in front of customers, I would say, than nothing at all. Having put that framework in place, you need to trade it as one organization. If your brand and marketing, if your DM and <coughs> sorry, your SEO and your content, everything that you're doing, is, if that's not all tied together, uh, you're going to be less than the sum of your parts. And I think that is the key part. The bottom box on there, that's the hardest part for me. Uh, it's very, it, is, it, it can be a, a pretty technical thing uh, and, a, and a pretty uh, scientific thing to put some of these things together. But ultimately, having laid out your plan, if your organization isn't aligned, I think you're pretty stuffed. I, I chaired a conference at the Retail Hive recently where we got a lot of retailers together uh, and we asked them a lot of questions. And the key, the key one that came out for me was, we put this question to that audience and it was, customers are demanding an ever more seamless experience regardless of channel. What is preventing you from delivering it? 61% said it was a culture and organization. 32% said it was a strategy. We have lots of ideas, but no clear plan. Only 7% it was technology. Only 7% said we can't find the right solutions. Most of the right solutions are probably outside of there. But when you bring them inside, are you all going to use them properly as an organization to drive your business in the way that you should? So that really should result in a pretty clear retail model. And I've, this is a bit probably basic for some of you, but you know those... those um, traditional uh, retail 10 A's of, uh, of price, of, of product, of availability are still true, but there's all these other complications around them now that you also need to be good at. What's your content strategy? What's your content with your social partners to make sure that you're attracting out there within all that noise customers that want to shop with you? Um, and, and in particular, fulfillment is a, is a heady cost for omnichannel retailers. How are you gonna do that? Um, in, a, in a world where Amazon Prime gives you same day on millions, sorry, next day on millions of products. How are, you, how are you going to compete with that? Can you really do it yourself? Um, what I'm just going to come on to is that I think that unless you are focused on your customer profitability and that you're moving from enterprise profitability to channel profitability, but ultimately to customer profitability, what, what, who is your core customer? How many of them do you need? How much should they buy from you? And to the extent that you've got facsimile customers who are shopping with your competitors that you could attract, how are you going to get them? And I think unless you're obsessed about that, this model is probably not going to work in the future. I'm being deliberately a bit controversial, by the way. I think we all need to be great at measuring. And, and when you get into your trading meetings, are you all really aligned to every, on your daily standards and your weekly trading meetings? Are you all taking, talking about the same KPIs? 
Or do you get the trading commercial director coming along talking about, well, category performance was like this today, so we need to do this. And then you get your e-commerce director going, well, online, we were doing this, so therefore we need to do that. And in stores, is your stores director saying, well, I've got a bit of a different story. I, I've, have you got anybody in that trading meeting is saying, well, actually, our business plan and our strategy said we needed to attract this many more customers and grow them in this way. Is that actually translating into your, your daily, weekly trading meetings? Because if it isn't, I don't see how you're going to implement your strategy. I think if you don't have an enterprise scorecard, I've put some examples up there. It probably won't work for um, everybody uh, exactly as set out. But an example of across that, across that shopping funnel from discovering your brand to shopping with your brand to being uh, fulfilled in terms of getting the product that you want to then becoming a loyal customer, are you really clear about the metrics that you're driving? So... On the next slide, I was, going to, I was going to sort of focus on the loyalty piece. My view of loyalty is that it's important, um, but it should be driving around how do I make the cost of doing business more affordable in the future. So I like to look at a variable P&L in terms of gross margin. So how can I maximize my sales? Yes. How do I maintain my margin? Absolutely. But in terms of acquiring and retaining my customers, what's my gross margin after that? And I put the cost of my loyalty scheme in that cost of acquiring and retaining and keeping my customers. So if your loyalty scheme is costing you more than it, than it should do to acquire and retain those customers, you're giving money away. I think that also aligns to your promotional activity. So if you're a brand uh, where you've got your most loyal customers wait for you to discount to get to the lowest possible price and then they'll shop with you, you're giving margin away that you probably don't need to if you've got the right loyalty scheme. So unless you get down to a, a, a segmentation that works for you about who your core customers are and who you want to trade into that and then how you actively manage those segmentations, are you talking about those at your trading meetings? Are you talking about the value of your, your core customer? If you're not, again, I think, I think you're, you're, you are being inefficient and, and at risk of, um, of not creating the right enterprise value that you should. So let's just quickly go on to that. Um, how, do you, how do you do it? Personalization. There's some pretty broad, broad uh, uh, buckets here, and there are various ways to sort of attack this. But essentially, what we're talking about is the developing the expertise to be able to personalize and reward each company's, sorry, each customer's experience at every touch point in every channel, acting like a butler, not a stalker. Now, you obviously can't go, you can't go from zero to 100 all at once, but there are ways to start to get into this and to work with the data that you have. It is a fact that most organizations only use about 20% of the customer data that they've got. So yes, it's great to have a goal to get to a single view of the customer with all the data that you've ever had on them, but start small, start experimenting, prove to your business that if you do that, you can actually drive superior returns, superior ROI from better targeting, more relevant emails, personalized abandoned baskets, uh, small things like that. Uh, can start to make quite a big difference. So have a plan to go from day one, or wherever you are, to get to a consistent view of the customer and how to organize and increasingly enrich that data through third parties. A lot of providers will help you to do that in terms of um, what the social um, context is, what the device context is, uh, what they just did, did last to be able to get that, to that next best action, which is what your analytics is about. Uh, you really need to have that analytic capability to be able to do it. How do you increasingly be able to say, I've got a memory of you? Um, I think that's what customers expect. If I go into a store, if I've been online, if I've been on my mobile, if I'm not joined together in that customer journey, in that mission, and I go from the mobile to the app, and the app doesn't know that I've started a shopping mission on, my mo on the mobile, and, I get, and increasingly if I go into the shop, and the customer assistant looks at me blankly and says, have you come to pick up a parcel? Yes, I have. You've been notifying me all the way through that the parcel's ready, and I've now come to collect it, and you don't know who I am. It displays that you've got no memory of that customer. So it's, it's almost discourteous not to do that. Um, so I think you have, to, you have to think about how do you join that together uh, to, um, to give that, that experience that the customer expects that's um, consistent with your brand. And then getting into the sort of meat of it, what's your segmentation strategy? Uh, what is required to encourage and reward behavior? You really get to, need to get to know your customer very well. I'm sure that all your CEOs, perhaps your marketing directors would say, oh yeah, we really know who our core customer is. But do they really? Do they, have they really been watching their daily, weekly trading habits? Are you really questioning that all the time? Are you really saying, that's the strategy, that's the customer strategy that we did at the start of the year. 
for half a year ago, actually, are we actually, are we actually executing that strategy? You really need to focus properly on uh, measuring customer performance. Where are we now? Um, probably for some of you, this is, this is a bit of um, sucking eggs, but uh, there, are, there are ways to do it, obviously, which are based on life stage, which are based on developing your own personas if you want to attract, but ultimately, you need to report against it. That's the harder part. Uh, I've seen a lot of businesses that go, oh, yes, we've got Joe, and they're our target customer, we know what they do, but do you report against Joe as a customer? If she is really your target, how many more Joes did you get last week? What's the value of Joe compared to last year? Are you really thinking about the profitability of your core customers? So you do need a clear, recognizable grouping of those target customers. Um, you need to go to a next level of segmentation where you can actually understand the behavioral characteristics, back order with qual and quant research to make sure that you're really clear about it. These things can move quite fast. Um, and make sure that you're, you're, you're aligned as an organization on what those key performance indicators are for those segments so that you know that when you run a promotional campaign, what the expectation should be about how you wanted those customers to react. Obviously, there's a time series there <coughs> in terms of looking at the, the, the impact of promotions over time, uh, but that customer focus needs to come, I think, into your reporting. How to get there? Do start experimenting with it. Um, do show, do prove uh, against control groups, MV2, all the rest of it, that you're actually producing results with this, that is iterative and challenge your marketing director on their budget. Um, I think too often I've seen that marketing directors get a budget to built based on the previous year and oh, so much on brands, so much on traditional media, so much on digital. Um, I'd, I'd encourage you all to think about, well, should we not just zero-based budget every time to make sure that if we've got a rich customer uh, proposition here or a customer offer here that's really going well, rather than stop when we've spent the budget, we keep going whilst ever it's still profitable to do that. And we only stop when we've mined out that particular um, opportunity. Are you really thinking in that, in that mindset? Um, moving on, just quickly then. So mo mobile, I think mobile is the key enabler of all of this. Everything I've talked about in terms of omnichannel, I think, comes down to these days. If you can't do all of this on your mobile, uh, you're going to be disappointed in the customer. Um, I've, I've pinched some um, stats from Hitwise here. So anybody here from Hitwise? Thank you. Um, but it's interesting to see what happened just before Christmas. So in December 2016, 52% of total retail visits were made uh, from mobile devices. So it is a fact, really, that most shopping starts and increasingly ends on mobile. So unless you're showcasing your entire omnichannel end-to-end -end proposition on mobile, customers aren't going to be encouraged to think, oh, am I going to be able to get that product? Um, can I collect it from a nearby store, from a collect plus, or uh, can I have it delivered at a time that suits me? Um, how much is that going to cost? What, what, is, what is the end-to-end -end transaction? Um, and <clears throat> if, you, if you've got separate desktop, separate mobile, you, know, you really need to think about how you're going to make that into a more responsive experience so that at any one point in time, whatever I'm looking at your brand on, that I can say, yeah, it's generally an omnichannel retailer. Uh, they're absolutely clear about what they're going to do for me. There's a next step, obviously, to personalizing that based on my preferences, what I've bought, and all the rest of it. But on a basic level, are you telling your customers what your omnichannel experience is on your mobile? Uh, the majority of, of UK retailers are not. So this was another part of the brief. Um, what can bricks and mortar players do to take on the pure players, especially as they enter the high street? Um, Innovating and, and delivery customer service and all of that lot, it's really accelerating. And obviously, um, you know, the big three, uh, Facebook, Google, Amazon, they've got massively deep pockets and are able to do things that are outside of most people's budgets. Um, you know, Amazon, Amazon Prime is an amazing law shuffle where you actually pay to join, you probably know it as well as I do. But I use it without thinking. I don't think about the monthly payment, I just use it because it's flipping convenient. And it does what it says. Interesting to hear recently they're probably rowing back a bit on um, Amazon Go in terms of um, rolling that out in the UK, but it's an, it's, it's an example of the, what they've got to deploy in that area. Um, and on the right-hand side, I think uh, some of these new entrants are going to be really disruptive. So I've most recently come from Beauty, and um, the, um, the lady who set up um, Soap and Glory, uh, Marcia, I think her name is, she's just set up a new startup venture called Beauty Pie, 
which is absolutely personalised in terms of looking at your skin, what does it do, what products do you need. But then what she's done is she's working with the same manufacturers who work with the big brands um, <coughs> to, to, to sell you very expensive products. And she's offering the same product, not branded, but the same quality. So she's been incredibly disruptive in that marketplace. <coughs> and that's a, fact, that's a fact of life. There are no, there are no uh, rules around this anymore. Um, so what does a traditional retailer are you, going to, are you going to be able to do if you're a traditional retailer to, uh, to sort of fight back? And I'll just give you a, a couple of things because I'm such conscious of time. I would like to have a bit of time for Q&A. Approaches that work, and you might say, I would, I would say this anyway, but um, I think at Boots, we, um, when I was there, um, there was a genuine um, thinking about how to use some of your traditional assets, all your points of presence, your beauty consultants, the trust and impartiality that customers have in beauty to say, out of the world of beauty, what is right for me? How can I trust somebody to impartially recommend the right products for me uh, based on something that I trust? So beautiful use based around science, um, it's based around technology, it's based around data in saying we can apt accurately assess your skin and recommend the right products, you can trust that. Uh, it's, it's a generally omni-channel experience, uses the stores, uses the consultants, there's an online sign-up, Lots of great content to inspire you. Ultimately, it results in a subscription engine in your own beauty online beauty cabinet, which keeps replenishing um, <clears throat> in terms of telling you that you're running out of things or that you, there are new things which you would probably want to try. And done properly, the end-to-end -end conversion rates for, for properly built omnichannel experiences can be quite high. So the end-to-end, -end, we did a 12-week trial in 60 stores last year for that. The end-to-end -end conversion rate was over 75% from contacting a likely prospect, a customer who might want to use it, to then becoming a regular user of Beautiful You. So it can be done. I've never heard of conversion rates quite like that. But you need to think through every part of that customer journey, how do you retain them. Uh, more prosaically, um, a lot of retailers are doing this, but how do you put uh, the customer information in the hands of uh, your staff? How do you make sure that they are aware of what customers want to buy right now, how they can get it, is it in stock? Um, this is a joint venture with uh, Boots that uh, was done with Sales Assist. Uh, that product was a joint venture with IBM and, uh, and Apple, but it, but it puts the live Boots website into a colleague-facing uh, rendition, uh, tells through analytics what people are buying, what's trending on the site, uh, tells the colleague is it in the store or not, can they buy it for them, and if not, they can then uh, fulfill the transaction. Pets at Home I know are, are doing that too. Uh, if you look at retailers like Jigsaw, uh, they've also done something similar. And essentially what they're doing is bringing the whole of the range, the whole of the supply chain, all the inventory that they've got in the business, they're putting into the control of that colleague who can complete that customer journey. Because this is about not breaking a customer journey and using your stores and your colleagues in effectively an omnichannel way to help to complete that transaction as it moves from digital into, into physical. So I think these are good examples um, that you, can th that you can think about in terms of how do I make my store more into a fulfillment centre uh, as well as a place to, to come and browse. Um, just conscious of time, John Lewis, they're great. Um, I'll, I'm going to finish. I quite like this one. It's a bit gimmicky, but I quite like it. Anybody buy True Religion jeans? Um, if you go into their store in Carnaby Street, the staff are equipped with eye watchers. Uh, but what they've done that is to link that with the custom records. So the, so the if you've been on their app, the colleague will know what you've just been browsing and they'll know the geofence is stored, so they'll know who you are when you come in. So when you do come in, they can say, oh, hello, we know you've been looking at this. I've pre-prepared this range of jeans for you. Let's go and try them on. Um, maybe a bit gimmicky, but I quite like that in terms of you opted in for that experience uh, and the colleague's feeling really empowered and it kind of fits with the brand as well. I think it's a pretty cool experience. So uh, lots of different ways and means to, to think about it, but... Uh, it will be unique to your brand, unique to your, unique to your retailing footprint in terms of what you do. <clears throat> but I think you have to find a way to make your stores, your colleagues, empowered to, uh, to take on the pure place. How do, you, how, do you, um, how do you ultimately come up with a sustainably profitable business? I'm going I'm to I'm finish there. Yeah, I'm going to finish there. Because I want to leave a bit of time for Q&A. I think we've got about five minutes for Q&A. Yeah? There we go. What we'll probably do with Q&A, uh, the most sensible thing, is if I stand away from these bloody bright lights, 
and you uh, stick your hand up. We've got someone running with a microphone around the building, and I can point them in the right direction. So over to you, Robin. You asked me a question. When is e-commerce and what currently still happens in traditional CRM going to merge in the commercial side of most retailers? Most of the retailers I deal with are still separated to some degree, yeah. and I don't see this as being sustainable. Yeah. Um, in, my, in my view, I think you need a, a CEO uh, who wants that to happen, and he's prepared to rearrange their capabilities on their board to do that. Um, I think... Um, I think that this, the whole subject of board representation is um, one which comes from a very traditional retail mindset of operations and buying. Um, and if you want to, if you really see, think that this is going to be the substantial part of your business and that's where growth is going to come from, you need to be bold with the people that you put on the board and the responsibilities that you give to them. So unless you put together some of the more traditional uh, disciplines of marketing and add data and uh, customer relationship, customer experience to that role, yeah, you'll, you'll always be less than the sum of the parts, in my view. Um, uh, you said a very interesting one while you were speaking, that on Monday morning trading meetings where uh, category directors report on category and people don't report on customer performance, I couldn't see if any... I could hear some laughter, but I didn't, uh, I didn't see any hands or anything. Uh, who has their trading meetings where it's still category and revenue-related rather than customer-related? Hands up. Does anyone do it custom first? Ah, one, one lady there is customer first. So there is a degree of revolution coming, but it's slow and small at the mm. moment. Uh, next question. There's a, there's a lady at the back there in the middle with the white shirt. Hi. Um, what, so what I have to ask is that the U these US companies, so like Google, Amazon, Facebook, um, seem to really be heading, heading up personalization. And to be honest, in the UK, we seem quite far behind it. And even though people recognize it as being a very powerful tool, why do you think that is, that we're behind? Um, I think, in my, in my experience, there's um, personalization is a massive term. And that what um, I think probably we as um, digital professionals haven't been very good at is saying what we mean by that. Uh, so personalization can be as big as you, you want it to be. Um, but I think being able to speak plainly to marketing directors to say, actually, it's just been a bit more relevant. If you, if you refer to something which that customer has already done and you're, you're helping them to do something next, that's personalization. And actually, the ROI goes up by about 2 or 3%. I think, I think there's a demystification required of, of where do you start. So I think, I think what could be clear is to, is to paint a bit of a roadmap as digital professionals for our boards to say, look, this is how you can start to get into it. I think if you, I think if you don't do that and try and boil the ocean from the start and, and try and do something as, as, you know, as on mass as Amazon, Google, and Facebook, you're probably not going to get there in time. Hello. As marketers, one of the things we struggle is to collect marketing permissions to mm. reach more customers. Do you have any suggestions around that area other than giving money off vouchers? Yeah, I think that's a really good question, actually. Um, so I think it does lead you down the role, uh, the role of um, road, sorry, of uh, differentiated permissions. So based upon who you are. So if I, if you take health, for example, because uh, I was thinking about this at, at Books, if I've got diabetes, and you're helping me to manage that condition, and I, I get my prescription and all my over-the-counter the medicines to, to manage it. If, if I'm presented with um, an opt-in which says, if you've got diabetes, you want to get these things, I, you're much more likely to go, yeah, I really need that help. Um, so <clears throat> I, think, I think tailored permissions based upon who you absolutely know your customer is, is something that we'll probably see more of. Uh, that, that's entirely right. Uh, the, many years ago, when I was head of CRM for a media group, we did tailored permission according to the content that people might consume. And it 
it, it really gutted the newsroom that nobody, want, nobody opted in to hear about news, because that's like saying, my favorite ice cream is vanilla. They were really interested in film or sport, the passion points and the interest areas, and that's just the theme there for, for health areas. N next question. Ha lady there. So you said that 60% within a culture stop alignment. How do we overcome that? Have you got any top tips for us in making an organisation aligned? Yeah, I think you have to give proof points, um, which is why I was so passionate about finding a little bit of space for a bit of budget to do a bit of innovation. And I don't mean sort of a massive tech lab, but just to be able to experiment with customers to, sh to, to prove what you're trying to do. And you can do that on a relatively small budget um, and, and do some tests and learn against some control groups to prove to your CEO, to your marketing director that you are going to get a better return out of it. I found that as the most powerful way to, pers to, to, get pers uh, to persuade your, your fellow board members and your CEO. Well, I think that's, we're, we're slightly over time. That's, uh, that's enough questions. I'd like to thank Robin very much for his time and his very, uh, very, uh, it's, it's littered with useful stuff that we can take away presentation. So thank you very much, Robin.